My question is for Mr. Cowan. Um, you made a distinction between toddlers who are prostituted and adults who are prostituted. Sometimes adults who are prostituted enter prostitution as toddlers or children. So, uh, could, you, could you move the mic? Yeah. Uh, my question to you is a simple one. Is it okay to buy a 20-year-old woman if that woman entered prostitution as a 4-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old? Probably not. There are plenty of cases, as I'm more than willing to admit, where what goes on is wrong. But again, look at the resolution. The key point is that there are diverse practices in multiple worlds. What you're finding from the other side is to take a woman in a difficult situation, choosing her best option. I'm saying blame the difficult situation. They're saying blame the best option. It's a very simple choice. Which one are you going to blame? Again, I say blame the difficult situation. Gentleman in the far right. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Emanuel Castan. I'm a professor of psychology at the New School for Social Research, and I have a question for the uh, panel in favor of the motion. Uh, when you were describing your prototypical prostitute, uh, it came to mind to me uh, a, a prototypical coal mine worker. Uh, typically exploited for two or three generations, they had no other chance but, but going to the mines, and typically they suffer long-term mental and physical health consequences, negative consequences for their uh, employment. And I would uh, suspect that you would make a, a, a difference between this, and you would argue that there are two different cases. And my, I suspect that uh, your uh, making a difference on this will be based on disgust. And uh, as many uh, philosophers of law have argued, um, I, and I agree with um, basic... I, I, I need you to get... I think we see where you're going, but I need you to get to a question. Yes. The, uh, so the question is whether it is on, on disgust that you make this, this difference. And, uh, and I would argue this would not be appropriate. As many philosophers have argued, we should not uh, legislate on the basis of disgust. We're, we're talking Melissa about Farley. the evidence of harm here, not uh, a moral or emotional reaction. And the evidence of harm, I think the other side uh, has just conceded the debate. If it's wrong to prostitute someone who was a child when they entered prostitution, then what we know, and there's no argument about these numbers, is that in the vicinity of 75 to 85 or 90 percent of everyone in prostitution entered prostitution as a legal minor, oftentimes a 13 or 14 year old. That's a fact. Sydney Barris. When she says that's a fact, that may be a fact with respect to the people who have been interviewed. But you have to remember that the people who were interviewed for this sort of thing are a great minority. They're the ones that are in the most trouble. They're the ones that end up you know, being the most messed up. And so they're the ones that these people get to talk to and to interview. And I'm not debating that these people have horrible problems. But to take a small minority and, and to apply their problems to the majority is just wrong. Catherine McKinnon. Well, this research has been very carefully designed so that they really are a representative sample of people at all levels, at all stages, at all class divisions, positions uh, in the industry. Uh, it, it, what's being described um, by Ms. Barrows is research she doesn't know. Um, and, it, what, and the PTSD rates uh, don't vary according to class level, is the other thing to remember. Um, as to coal mine work and its negative consequences, uh, what you described is some people's human rights are being violated through this work that in the way that it's being done in the coal mine industry. They have human rights and they need to be recognized. What we're talking about is people whose human rights are being violated and they need to be addressed. Now as it happens, whenever someone else is selling you for sex, you are trafficked and your human rights are being violated. The vast majority of people in the sex industry, somebody else is taking the pimp's cut off their prostitution. And, they're do and, and this is what is being bought when you're buying sex. This is the reality of it. It is an industry of human rights violation. Question from the top, please. We 
have, we have criminal laws against child abuse. We have criminal laws against slavery. There are criminal laws that cover this kind of, um, of, of repression of human rights. Now, as far as prostitution is concerned, if you take out the children that have been prostituted and the people who are held against their will, what you have is a contractual relationship. And I don't see anything wrong with that. What you have is that most 3% of the industry. Is that what you're defending? Why would an upscale call girl even bother to be interviewed? The people that you don't hear from are the ones, what's in it for them? They have no problem with it. They're not about to go and bitch and complain that they're being, you know, abused when they're perfectly happy about it. You only hear from the unhappy people. Well, one of the things, Melissa Farley. One of the things, one of the things, to hear Melissa, what Melissa Farley. One of the things researchers have attempted to do is to increase the numbers of people we interview in indoor prostitution because it has been argued and it has been my experience that indoor prostitution in legal brothels and massage parlors in upscale call girl agencies is often the, where the most harmed people are held, the most trafficked, the youngest. And so you can't make that assumption. Researchers, not myself, um, another person in San Francisco, and I've had this experience too, is that when we try to talk to pimps about interviewing their girls, we're denied permission to speak with them. Sid Sydney, I'm, uh, you're rolling your eyes, and I'd like to put some words behind that. I just, I, this whole thing is just so absurd, I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, <laughs> There is nothing in it for the girls who don't have a problem with it to talk to these researchers. Why would they bother? When you don't she... even know how many of them are out there. A problem. Wendy Shalit? I don't think it's accurate to say that we haven't heard from these high-end call girls. We have heard from them. For example, in your book, Ms. Barrows, you talked about Claudette. She's the most empowered call girl, right? And she herself said, this kind of work can be very taxing, both physically and emotionally. I've never met a man who can really understand what it takes out of you. And I think that even the most supposedly empowered call girls, when they are interviewed, do say, th See, say things like this. Way. No, but I think that... Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes round two of our debate. <laughs>